Well, thank you. Uh, I'm going to assume that the slides will show up. <laughs> do I need to do anything to make the slides happen? No, just barge ahead. Well, what I want to, but the slide is a visual joke. You know, it's very important to this first moment to get off on the right foot. <laughs> and I just wanted to point out that this is going to be about the A double dot part. At first I thought that was uh, kind of a mark that told you how to pronounce the vowels, but it turns out that's only true, that's only true in some other languages. And I'm going to tell you about, uh, in about 40 minutes, about the way in which exploding stars, supernovae, uh, allow you to measure the history of cosmic expansion, which I, I will spoil the suspense, uh, turns out not to be decelerating, as of course most people expected 10 years ago or 15, uh, but accelerating. Uh, and as many of you know, uh, this um, uh, work by the two groups, the Supernova Cosmology Project, headed by Saul Perlmutter, and the HI-Z team, uh, for which uh, Brian Schmidt and Adam Reese uh, b were the uh, people who received the Nobel Prize um, the last week. And so I thought I would say a few words about the Nobel Prize, because everybody seemed uh, interested in this. First of all, uh, uh, when you come to Sw Stockholm for this event, um, they put you up in a hotel, much as uh, we're in a hotel here. Uh, and uh, there are a few differences, however. Uh, in that hotel, they have uh, doors on the lobby, whereas here uh, it's wide open. There, the idea is that you have to keep the cold air out and the warm air in. Here, apparently, uh, it's the other way around. And in, uh, uh, outside, you can uh, observe some things here. You can walk down to the Arabian Sea and go swimming. Uh, there, uh, in Sweden, in November, in October, what month is this? In December, uh, of course, there is a phase change that takes place, and there is frozen water on which you can skate. Okay, so here we are in the lobby. Uh, this is uh, on, uh-oh, now I can't do this. Left, right, this is so confusing. Uh, let me see. Uh, that's me in the middle wearing the uh, outdoor jacket, and Adam Reese and Brian Schmidt, who were both my graduate students uh, at Harvard and who worked on problems related to cosmology and supernovae uh, for their thesis work and got going on the work that led to the Nobel Prize uh, while they were at Harvard and uh, shortly after. Uh, so uh, just to give you the picture, uh, in the uh, concert hall for the uh, uh, is the, the concert hall of uh, Stockholm, the Royal Concert Hall, is the place where the ceremony takes place. All those blue chairs represent people who were sitting up on the stage. The guys in the uh, funny uh, suits are the members of the high Z team. That's uh, uh, Nancy Schoenfeld, who's uh, Adam Reese's wife, is the one standing on the chair taking the picture of all of us. Uh, and there we are, dressed in clothes that we will never wear again. <laughs> And here's Adam and Brian. You can see they're really, really happy. Getting the Nobel Prize is a big deal, and not dropping the medal when the, pre when the king hands it to you is the most important thing, and they, had, they did okay. All right, so what I want to do uh, now is to tell you in, as a brief uh, account of uh, cosmic acceleration, and I'd like to go back to the time of Einstein in 1916, formulating general relativity in 1917, applying it to the universe. The important point is that uh, the astronomy of the time was quite different from the astronomy of today, and when people said universe, they meant the Milky Way. They meant the galaxy in which uh, we are located. And so this image of the Milky Way was what people were trying to explain. Uh, those of you who are very sophisticated will notice that there are some nebulae, some little fuzzy spots, like uh, down in the lower right there, uh, the Magellanic Clouds, or over on the left side you can see uh, M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. Of course, today we would say those are the things that show us the universe, but here, uh, the, at the time, 
Um, it was the stars of the Milky Way that were the things uh, that Einstein knew about uh, whose motions needed to be explained. And of course, their motions uh, were very small. The stars have very s small uh, velocities, and it was that idea that led Einstein uh, to put in this supplemental term, as he called it. Can you uh, see that in the back? Can you see that in the back? Can you read it? No, it's in German. It says, <laughs> it says uh, that term, the cosmological term, is necessary only for the purpose of making possible a quasi-static distribution of matter as required by the fact of the small velocities of the stars. So often people present this as a kind of philosophical idea that Einstein had, it may have been, uh, but it's also true that he adduced this particular fact and put in the cosmological constant to make a static universe. On the other hand, what he meant by universe was the Milky Way. Okay, well, that idea, which was uh, current astronomy in 1917, was not current astronomy uh, for very long. And as you all know, uh, through the work of Henrietta Leavitt at the Harvard Observatory, who calibrated uh, variable stars, and then Edwin Hubble, who observed those same stars in distant galaxies, we learned that we live in a universe of galaxies, that the Milky Way is not the whole story, that the distances to those nebulae are much bigger than the extent of the Milky Way. What's more, uh, there was a kinematic part uh, to the story, which was discovered by this fellow, uh, Vesto Melvin Slifer, working at the Lowell Observatory, and he measured the spectra of these fuzzy little patches. People thought they might have something to do with the formation of uh, planetary systems. And anyway, he investigated them, and he found, it, he found that they had the spectra of stars, some of them did anyway, uh, but that the lines were shifted and they had very large velocities compared to those of the stars of the Milky Way. What's more, they had a systematic uh, shift to the red, that most of them were shifted away from us. And it's Hubble, who by 1929 put these two measurements together on a plot, uh, which we call the Hubble diagram, which he called figure one, uh, which is, tells you the relation between uh, velocity and distance that we all know now as the indicator that we live in an expanding universe. Hubble himself was not so sure about that and thought that it was a very uh, highbrow kind of philosophical, or anyway, theoretical physics concept to think, of the, to think of this as indicating the expansion of the universe, and he never committed himself uh, on that point. Nevertheless, here we are in 1931, so just a few years uh, after that, and here's Einstein visiting the library of the Mount Wilson Observatory, the offices in Pasadena, at 813 Santa Barbara Street. And you can see Einstein in the middle. Uh, that's Michelson uh, standing there very proudly with his pipe uh, pointing toward himself. It says, I got the Nobel Prize too. Uh, and then the tall man by the portrait is Edwin Hubble. He's being patted on the head by George Ellery Hale, the man who was responsible for building the world's largest telescope four times and providing the technical uh, support that allowed uh, Hubble to do his work. Oh, I thought I'd taken this out. Uh, well, of course, Einstein uh, uh, was uh, somewhat uh, taken aback, I suppose, or anyway, felt he'd uh, gotten off on the wrong foot by uh, putting the cosmological constant into his equations. Uh, once uh, He did it for the purpose of making a static universe, but as he wrote to Weil on a postcard, uh, if there's no static universe, then away with the cosmological constant. This is usually uh, described in a pungent way where people say it was Einstein's greatest blunder. And I have always wondered, did Einstein ever say that? And it turns out the reason we say it is because George Gamow said it in his autobiography, My World Line. He said, Einstein's original gravity equation was correct and changing it was a mistake. Much later, when I was discussing cosmological problems with Einstein, I have to say, I wanted to have that phrase in my book, but I couldn't do it. Much later, when I was discussing cosmological problems with Einstein, he remarked that the introduction of the cosmological term was the greatest blunder he ever made in his life. 
But this blunder, rejected by Einstein, is still sometimes used by cosmologists even today. And the cosmological constant denoted by the Greek letter lambda rears its ugly head again and again and again. Okay, George. So it's really George Gamow who I think put those words into Einstein's mouth. Uh, it is true that Einstein and uh, De Sitter very soon after the cosmological constant and talked about the Einstein-De Sitter model that uh, we all know. But he was not, uh, but there were some people who did not uh, follow that lead. And among them was Georges Lemaitre who had earlier in the 1920s worked out a correct a solution to Einstein's equations, which involved uh, cosmic expansion or contraction. Um, he made the double mistake of uh, publishing it in French and in a Belgian journal, uh, which meant that this article was not widely read, even by uh, Eddington, to whom he had sent it. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that article was eventually uh, rediscovered in 1929-1930. Lemaitre, however, had an idea of what the cosmological constant was, which it sounds very much like our modern idea. So I'll read what he said. In 1934, he wrote a little article. Everything happens as though the energy in the vacuum would be different from zero. We associate a pressure, P equals minus rho c squared. Today we'd say that was W equals minus one, that is that coefficient out in front. Uh, to the energy density rho c squared of vacuum. This is essentially the meaning of the cosmological constant lambda. Well, that sounds like something somebody might have said yesterday uh, in uh, one of the sessions about uh, the dark energy. But it is true that Einstein's uh, statue at the National Academy in Washington uh, has no lambda in the equation, as you can see there. He also has E equals mc squared, you know that one and the equation for the photoelectric effect. Uh, that's the one for which the Nobel Prize Committee had the temerity to, the courage to give him the Nobel Prize. He didn't go to the party either. Well, never mind that. Okay, so on to the uh, business of supernovae and measuring uh, the um, cosmological constant or the presence of it, or rather having it rear its ugly head again and again and again, only this time uh, with evidence. There are uh, exploding stars which, for a little while, about a month, are as bright as about four billion stars like the sun, so they can be seen uh, to large distances. This is about a million times brighter than the Cepheid variables that were used in Hubble's uh, our initial work to measure the distances to the galaxies. So that means if they're a million times brighter, you can see them a thousand times farther away, roughly speaking. The distances to the nearby galaxies are a few million light years, and so that, meant, that means that if you could harness supernovae for this purpose, you could measure distances to a few billion uh, light years. The disadvantage of the supernovae is, of course, that they are rare. There's only about one per century uh, in a galaxy, so if you assign uh, a graduate student a particular galaxy to work on, they will not complete their thesis uh, for 100 years. Sometimes it seems like that, even when you use other methods. The person who pursued this idea of these uh, exploding stars, these novae that were taking place in galaxies that were a thousand times farther away than the novae in our own galaxy, that they must uh, inferred that they must be much more luminous, uh, and gave them the, the name that we use today, the supernovae, of course, that was Fritz Zwicky, and here he is shown in a mode that we don't often uh, see, doing his uh, uh, serious observational work with this large, uh, for the day, uh, Schmidt telescope, the first of the Schmidt telescopes. This is the Fritz Wicke that is sort of in our minds, a uh, pioneer of supernovae, pioneer of dark matter, and of course a pioneer of gestures. Here he is demonstrating what he called the spherical bastard, and he talked about his colleagues, he said, they are spherical bastards, bastards anyway you look at them. <laughs> Now, 
The idea that we have underlying these explosions is that they are uh, thermonuclear explosions of white dwarfs, so at the end of its life, a star like the sun will make a carbon and oxygen uh, white dwarf. The carbon and oxygen is fuel for thermonuclear reactions and under the right circumstances can be ignited. We think that the circumstance is the mass transfer in a binary, although the collision with another white dwarf uh, is another possibility. In any case, we have the idea that you can burn from carbon and oxygen up to iron, nuclear statistical equilibrium for these, uh, for these states is in the iron peak, it's nickel 56, uh, an element which is radioactive and uh, decays uh, to cobalt and iron uh, in a radioactive chain that supplies energy over a long period while this uh, atmosphere is expanding and produces a very conspicuous display of light that we can see halfway across the universe. Just to say this idea that exploding stars of this type, which are quite homogeneous, presumably because the Chandrasekhar mass is a kind of fixed mass, uh, although I'll show you it's not quite true, uh, this idea that you could use these explosions to measure distances from apparent brightness was something which was uh, underway in the 1960s. Here's a picture of Charlie Kowal, uh, who just died last month, who uh, I went observing with uh, at Palomar, and he's holding the most advanced technology of its time, a very large photographic plate, uh, which was used to search large areas of the sky for new stars for uh, the supernovae. Uh, and here's Charlie's Hubble diagram from 1968. And uh, what's plotted on the vertical axis is velocity, on the horizontal axis is uh, the magnitude, which corresponds to the distance. This is like Hubble's diagram, except being a highly professional diagram with large errors, uh, this is a log-log plot. Um, and what you can see here is that there is some relation the, uh, between the distance and the uh, brightness, that is, uh, that it, between the velocity and the brightness. Uh, although there's quite a lot of scatter, the distances were good to about 30%, Charlie reckoned, in 1968. But he thought that most of the error was due to measurement error, and that the individual supernovae might be good to five or 10 percent. And he even said, in a prophetic way, it may be possible to measure the second order term in the redshift magnitude relation when light curves become available for very distant supernovae. Yesterday, Jim Peebles showed us the uh, original article from Alan Sandage that showed how in this plane of redshift and magnitude, there would be curved lines that corresponded to different world models and that you could select them from the measurements uh, that were made with sufficiently precise uh, objects. And what I'm going to tell you is, of course, that we've done that uh, with supernovae. Let me show you, this is the modern version of the nearby supernova collection uh, with redshift and magnitude. This is from the work that uh, my graduate student Malcolm Hicken did uh, at the Center for Astrophysics. And what's so interesting about this is that the scatter is small, the scatter is the same as a function of distance, although these are not very large distances. This shows that the type 1a supernovae really have become the kind of measuring tool that we need in order to see effects of, let's say, 10 percent or so on the effective um, luminosity distance uh, to distant objects. The intercept of this diagram is, of course, the Hubble constant, since it's the log-log plot. Uh, and Adam Rees, in addition to his fine work that uh, won the Nobel Prize, has been working quite hard on the calibration of that by measuring the distances by other means to some of the galaxies that have had uh, type 1a supernovae in them. And the uh, result that uh, Adam gets is a Hubble constant of about 74 kilometers per second with a very good precision, uh, an uncertainty of about uh, three and a half uh, kilometers per second. This is uh, of interest, of course, because, as Jim explained yesterday, that sets the time scale for the universe. I'll come back to that. And it also, uh, as you know, in the big fits to the, to the CMB, where you're wandering through a very large uh, um, matrix of, uh, of parameters, uh, it's very helpful to have uh, some parameters that you actually know from measurement. The units of the Hubble constant are kilometers per second per megaparsec. 
it's good to find the Hubble constant by measuring a velocity in kilometers per second and dividing by a distance uh, which you have measured in addition to going through the uh, rather complicated plots that people use, uh, uh, techniques that people use to fit uh, the information from the CMB. Okay. So what is the history of cosmic expansion? You need to look deep into the past, find the supernovae whose light has been traveling to us through the expanding universe, and by measuring the apparent magnitude of the distant supernova, infer what has been happening along the line of sight. If the universe has been slowing down, then the distance that the light has to traverse in a decelerating universe is a little smaller. The supernova will appear brighter. If the universe is accelerating, then while the light's in flight, the expansion will mean that the distance is larger and the supernova will appear dimmer. So the task is to find the distant supernovae and compare them to the nearby ones. Here's a kind of diagram of the cosmic expansion, and the idea is that you can tell about what has happened in the past, and then you can speculate, if you wish, about what will happen in the future. So on this diagram, the present is marked about in the middle. The piece that we can look at is upstream. We can look into the past and make these measurements of distance and redshift. The question of what happens in the future is something which depends on the nature of the dark energy, whether it is the cosmological constant or some other thing. Okay, so uh, I think it is very unlikely that the measurements we're talking about could have been done much earlier. And the reason is that uh, we benefited tremendously from advances in technology that took place late in the 1980s into the 1990s. Here I show Bev Oak, who was my thesis advisor, and he is holding very proudly one of the world's largest charged couple devices uh, at, at the same kind of uh, silicon detector that you use in digital cameras. This world leading device is a 0.24 megapixel uh, CCD. And it was with those early devices that people began to approach this problem. Uh, the first uh, serious attempt to do this was done by a Danish group uh, in 1988 and 1989, uh, and they published their results in this obscure journal, Nature, um, which uh, showed that they, after two years of searching, traveling every month to Chile from uh, they subtracted them, they did them, uh, uh, the measurements in real time, they did monthly searches, they had scheduled follow-up. The problem was the detectors were too small, so they did not really uh, uh, make much progress on this problem. It's analogous to uh, the Vikings. The Vikings, you know, came to North America, and, uh, uh, but when we tell the history of the discovery of North America by uh, the Europeans, uh, we leave the Vikings out. Uh, and in the same way, many people have failed to cite this paper uh, by, the, by this early group. Uh, and the reason is they came too early and uh, the technology was not quite ripe. What has happened since, of course, is the advance of computer fabrication for computer chips. Here I show you uh, a picture of John Tonry and a reflection of John Tonry in a uh, set of silicon uh, arrays, uh, which is really making his eyes light up. And what you can see is that in the ensuing decades that the detectors now are as big as the photographic plates, but of course they have 100 times the uh, quantum efficiency uh, and the information is directly digital, which we can calibrate and use in a much more effective way. So it's the technology which has really made this possible. It's not that people are much smarter than Einstein or much more skillful than uh, Hubble or more imaginative than Zwicky. No, I would say none of those is true. Nevertheless, uh, we've been able to do it recently because the technology has advanced. So here's uh, Brian Schmidt. Uh, just finishing up his thesis, which was on uh, measuring the Hubble constant by using a different kind of supernova and a different idea for how uh, uh, you would measure distances, uh, explaining to me how easy it's going to be to uh, find the distant supernovae. As I mentioned, there are two groups that were working in this field, the Supernova Cosmology Project out of the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, 
headed by Saul Perlmutter, uh, had been working in the field uh, for quite some time, uh, for six or eight years. And there were several people working on the software uh, during that time. So there were about 15 man years, uh, or maybe more, uh, in the software. And I said to Brian, Brian, you understand, the other guys have worked for 15 years to get this software going. He said, yes, yes. He thought it would take him about a month. Uh, and it was true, he did get it going in a month. And so, uh, you know, that's good work, uh, Brian. Okay, so let me just give you a clue uh, to what the software does. Uh, it's just really the same thing that the Danes had done, uh, which is you take a picture tonight, this is uh, this thing called Epic 2 could be tonight. That would be about one one thousandth of the image area for uh, the kind of detector uh, we used. Uh, if you had observed it last month, that would be Epic 1 over on the left. The idea is to do a digital subtraction of one image from another. And uh, anything that stays the same, like that big spiral galaxy down in the lower left, uh, is in both images. And so when you do the subtraction, it goes away. The thing that you see in this uh, subtracted image, epic 2 minus epic 1, is of course a dot, which is a star-like image, plausibly a supernova, in that other galaxy. And you can see if you look directly at the images for epic 1 and epic 2, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, but in the subtracted image, where we've scaled everything properly, uh, you not only see that nice dot, the software has apparently put a red circle uh, around it so that you can be sure it's what you're looking for. In fact. The software had many flaws, there are many false positives, uh, and we actually had to look at these things by eye in order to tell the real objects from the noise. The measurement of the supernovae is to, uh, it's a measurement of the brightness, but the, super, the brightness is not constant. The supernova gets brighter and dimmer. If you look at this uh, plot that shows light curves in many colors for a particular supernova, you can see if you look at something like the blue one, which is the blue light curve, that the width of that uh, maximum is about, a ma is about a month. And so searching in each successive dark run, the moon, you know, goes around in a, about a month, a month, uh, that uh, is about the optimum uh, for finding lots of supernovae. The light, as I've mentioned, is related to the thermonuclear uh, burn of the carbon-oxygen white dwarf. And one thing that uh, turned out to be quite interesting is an empirical relation between the shape of the light curve which doesn't depend on the distance, uh, and the luminosity that allows you to tell which of the supernovae are brighter and which ones uh, are dimmer. This was originally pointed out by Mark Phillips, who joined our team, uh, and exploited uh, in more detail in his thesis work uh, by Adam Rees uh, in a paper with Bill Press and with me. And it works something like this. If you look at the upper left-hand panel, that's meant to represent the blue uh, light curves, and the other ones are the other colors. And what you can see is there's this going up and going down, but there's also separation vertically. Some of the supernovae are brighter than others. Some are 100-watt bulbs, some are 75-watt bulbs, some are 50-watt bulbs. And if you do not uh, recognize them from the measurements, you can make errors in distance. If you have something that's intrinsically faint, you'll think it's far away. If you have something that's intrinsically bright, but you don't take that uh, into account, uh, you'll think it's closer than it really is. And the idea is that you can measure something, the light curve shape, and from that infer the intrinsic properties of the supernova. And because you can do that, you can compensate for the fact that the supernovae are not all the same luminosity. They, if you look at this plot, this is in astronomers' uh, tick marks, but uh, the difference between the most luminous and the least luminous of the type 1a supernovae is about a factor of three. And if we had made measurements in which the scatter was a factor of three instead of 10%, as I'll show you, uh, it would have taken a lot more supernovae uh, to undercover that there was cosmic acceleration. The other complication that Adam dealt with very effectively uh, was the presence of dust in supernova explosions. Dust in galaxies, this is a galaxy of an early type, which if you didn't know anything about it, you might say, oh, good kind of galaxy has no dust. But in fact, if you look at these things uh, carefully, they often do, and you can see silhouetted against the light from the stars in this galaxy, the dust which both absorbs light 
and reddens it. It absorbs or scatters the blue light more than the red light. So Adam worked out a way to use both of these effects uh, so that if you had measurements in more than one color, you could infer both the light curve shape and the amount of reddening and figure out how far away the supernova was. So here's a diagram that illustrates that. Uh, in the top panel, you see the raw measurements where uh, what's shown now is redshift horizontally and distance, a logarithmic uh, measure of the distance, inferred from the brightness uh, vertically. And you can see in the top panel, it's pretty bad. There's a lot of scatter. This doesn't look much like those Hubble diagrams. But after you use the light curve shape information, after you use the decline rate and the color, which is very important, uh, you can distinguish which objects are intrinsically faint and which objects have uh, a lot of dust along the line of sight and put them at the proper distance uh, as shown here. And the scatter, once you have done that, in the raw measurements is 0.15 magnitudes, that's the scale we use for flux. Uh, that cars, since it's the inverse square law, the, the uncertainty in the distance is about half that. It's about 7%. So what this says is that the prophecy that Charlie Kowal made in 1968 came true somewhere in the mid-90s, namely that we could measure distances to individual supernovae to better than 10%. What about finding the distant objects that uh, this job that uh, Brian said would be so easy? Here's the back of the envelope calculation. If there's a supernova every 100 years in a galaxy, that's about one every 5,000 weeks. So if you look at 5,000 galaxies, your chances of seeing one that's had a supernova in the last week or so uh, is pretty good. And if you look at this image, uh, what you see are bright galaxies, but there are many galaxies, thousands of galaxies in this image. The ones that are uh, of interest are the faintest ones that you can make out uh, in this image. Those are the ones uh, which are far enough away so that measuring the brightness of the supernova will include information about the expansion in the universe that has taken place while the light was in flight. So that was the idea. You needed to uh, do the subtraction on these big images and on many fields. And we did that. The Supernova Cosmology Project was also doing it. We put together a team. This is uh, some of the members of our team we called the High z team. And so you see here uh, uh, John Tonry uh, uh, going from the left, John Tonry, Saurabh Jha, whose parents are from India, uh, Nick Sunsef, and then standing in the front as if they knew somehow that it was important to stand up front, uh, Adam Reese and Brian Schmidt. In the background is uh, Bruno Leibengut, who was my postdoc, uh, Alex Filipenko, there's me, uh, and uh, Mario Amui is shown in this picture. He was a part of our team uh, in 1995 and 96. And then in 1997, just as we were getting ready to publish the results about cosmic acceleration, he said he was entirely too busy as a graduate student at Arizona and he asked to be left off the paper. Well, okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. How could they pick those two? Okay. So uh, here's the idea, of course. What's the measurement you have to make? We're looking for a double dot. Uh, the astronomer uh, language we talked about, Q, they did better uh, later. And so did we. Uh, in the fall of 1997, Adam Reese was working on our early sample, and here's his notebook. Adam attended the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And if you go to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, there are many things happen to you. There are scars left on your soul in various ways, some of which are not so good. But one of which is good is that you always write things in your lab notebook. So here's Brian, uh, Adam's uh, lab notebook from fall of 97. And he was working out for the data we had what the best value of omega matter might be. And so here it's shown over on the right-hand side. Omega matter is minus 0.36. Negative mass seemed like a very, well, a novel concept in a way. Uh, uh, Adam called me up and he said, I, I can't believe it. I'm getting this result, which is the opposite of what the other guys had gotten. I said, well, never mind the other guys. Uh, you must have made a mistake. And uh, it's your job is to find it. So he worked on it for a little while. And then uh, Brian did a, an independent analysis of the data. And uh, we convinced ourselves that the universe really 
did show this property that the distant supernovae were a little fainter than they would otherwise be, that this effect was not due to photometric calibration or some problem like that, that it was not due to the absorption by dust, because we had very good methods uh, for handling that, uh, and we were willing to uh, published the paper. So uh, we submitted a paper in March of 98. It came out in September of 1998. Here's the data uh, from our paper and also from the Perlmutter uh, paper, which came out nine months later, uh, that shows the low redshift supernovae over on the left-hand side and the high redshift ones uh, on the right-hand side. And then those different lines correspond to what you should expect for the relation between brightness and distance, uh, brightness and uh, redshift for uh, different cosmologies. In the bottom panel, you can see it a little more clearly where we've taken out the 45 degree line. And what you can see is that uh, the line that, the dashed line that curves down and to the right, uh, which is the value, f the, what you'd expect if omega matter was one, which I suspect if we had gone to a meeting like this in let's say 1992 and punched uh, cosmologists in the arm and asked them what do they think the value of omega matter was, many of them would have said, well, it's got to be one. Uh, the horizontal line is the value that we actually had measured up to that point of omega matter equals 0.3. Many times the theorists would stand over the observers and say, I believe it's one. And you'd say, well, we measure 0.3. And they'd say, well, that's a very difficult measurement, isn't it? And you'd say, oh, yes, we work very hard, and the answer is 0.3. Anyway, uh, what you can see is that the data points lie above that horizontal line. That means the supernovae are a little fainter. That means that uh, they're more distant. That means that the universe is accelerating. Okay, so that's the original data. Uh, this surprised Einstein quite a bit. And as you can see, he's now carrying under his arm a sheaf of papers, the top one of which gives an expression for lambda. What have we done since then, aside from walk around collecting prizes? Uh, bigger samples, extending the uh, supernova data to higher redshift, and as I'll show you, there's a very promising path forward to lower systematic errors uh, by observing in the infrared. So here's uh, today's sample. Uh, the sample I showed you before had about uh, 50 objects uh, and uh, gave a three sigma measurement that uh, uh, showed that you couldn't uh, get by with omega lambda of zero. Uh, today's data uh, has about 500 objects. Uh, as you can see from the fit is the, uh, a line for a, a universe that is accelerating. And down at the bottom, show, we show you the uh, deviation uh, from the fit. Kind of interesting, the scatter at the low redshift end is about as big as the scatter at the high redshift end. So that says the supernovae are doing okay. Uh, uh, and the measurements of the high redshift supernovae are not limited by you know, how bright they are or something like that. If you put all this together with the uh, uh, measurements from the CMB and from baryon oscillations, you get this uh, familiar diagram. The supernovae are more or less perpendicular to the CMB uh, constraint. That's because the CMB constraint measures omega lambda plus omega matter. The supernovae measure very nearly the difference, uh, and, uh, which is the uh, breaking due to gravitation. Uh, what's also interesting is that if for a given value of the Hubble constant, the supernova data picks out the cosmic age very, very well because it, it tells the relation between the age and the product H naught, T naught. And as you can see in this plot, I'll go back, the supernova one, two, and three sigma contours uh, really do pick out an age between 13 and 14 billion years very precisely uh, for the cosmic age given a Hubble constant uh, of about 72. Okay, so that's how we got this picture of the universe. People usually show a pie chart, uh, but uh, I thought I would show you this. Uh, you know, in the United States we have uh, dollars because they're shrinking, but they, uh, this on the back of them is this mystic uh, pyramid that shows uh, uh, the conscious part of the universe, about 4%, the atoms, and then below it, uh, big slabs of dark matter and dark energy making a new order of the ages. Well, I thought it was funny. Okay. 
And now, uh, for this audience, it's really quite daring of me to say anything about the theory. I know there are many more people here who know about this far better than I, but I just wanted to show you that I do have a uh, union card from the International Brotherhood of Theorists. <laughs> it's valid to infinity, so I feel comfortable uh, talking about this. Uh, and that is one possibility, is, of course, is to treat, as Lemaitre was saying, uh, the vacuum energy as a kind of source uh, on the right-hand side of Einstein's equation. So I thought it would be a good thing to do that. I went to uh, the statue of Einstein at the, uh, at the National Academy, and I was uh, going to carve it in there when the park police came by. Okay, everybody knows that the back of envelope shows there's not good quantitative agreement between the primitive estimates of what the dark energy might be uh, and what we really see. Uh, other possibilities, of course, which will be discussed uh, in the sessions this afternoon and on through the meeting are uh, something that is not constant, quintessence or some other, modifications to gravity. One thing that ha people have shown is that you cannot tell from the expansion history alone uh, whether modifications to gravity uh, are the right thing or not. So you need other information uh, including the growth of structure, and many people were, have been uh, talking about that and the possibilities of making really good measurements uh, with the Euclid satellite. Just to say where we stand on all of this, though, uh, the uh, index that measures the properties of the relation between pressure and density for uh, the dark energy is this thing we call W. Uh, I like to think of 1 plus W because I have so much trouble with these negative numbers. Anyway, uh, 1 plus W in the, the present uh, indication is that it's about uh, 0.01, uh, but the uncertainty is about uh, 0.06. That's the statistical uncertainty, and the systematic error is bigger than that. You might say, what a catastrophe. Uh, but I say, this is good. It means that the samples are now big enough that we don't need to just make bigger samples. We need to be smarter about what measurements we make. And the most promising of those are the near-infrared observations, which I want to say a word about before I stop. So let me skip ahead. I'll say that we've, this, these pictures cost a million dollars each, never mind. This is uh, observations of very distant supernovae with the Hubble Space Telescope that showed that the universe was slowing down, decelerating, before it was accelerating. Everybody knows that a change in position is called velocity. A change in velocity is called acceleration into the undying amusement of physics students everywhere. The change in acceleration is called the jerk. Uh, and this shows that there's been a change from slowing down to speeding up, the cosmic jerk. And here is a picture of Adam Reese under a headline in the New York Times that says, a cosmic jerk. Even his mother, even his mother does not like this picture. <laughs> Nevertheless. Okay, let me say a word about the future. Uh, we've been beating our heads against the systematic errors. The biggest one comes from uh, the uh, reddening by dust. And the way to get around that is to make the measurements in the infrared. Turns out the supernovae are better standard candles in the infrared and the dust is less of a problem. So here's Casey Mandel. Oh, sorry, this is a little out of date. He has a job. He's at uh, uh, Imperial College in London. Uh, Casey Mandel's a graduate student who's worked out how to do this. Let me show you the, oh, stop it. Oh, shoot, how do you get past this? Is there no way, oh, here we go, sorry, sorry. And here's the, here's the upshot. The panel on the left shows what happens for the optical, where there's a relation between the light curve shape, which is the thing on the horizontal axis, and the magnitude, the brightness of the supernova. And you can see that there's a slope to that. That's the relation between light curve shape and brightness. Uh, and the measurements, which are the red dots, have to be corrected up to those black dots uh, to compensate for reddening in many cases. The panel on the right-hand side is the infrared, where you see that the line is horizontal, that means the supernovae are all the same brightness, independent of their light curve shape, and the corrections for reddening are very small. So that's the way to go in the future. And here's the payoff. If you do the same thing we've done locally, uh, we're using these infrared measurements, the scatter goes down from about 0.15 magnitudes down to 0.10. That doesn't sound like much, but uh, the statistical weight goes like the square. It means they're twice as good 
uh, as measurements in the optical, and I think much more likely to give an accurate measurement as well. So the question is, how do we do that for the distant objects? I think the only way forward is to use the Hubble Space Telescope and to make the rest frame infrared measurements using the infrared camera on the Space Telescope. And I'll be proposing uh, to do that in the coming cycle. OK, that's enough. Oh, we don't need to see the raisins. We don't need to see all this stuff. I see you right there. <laughs> OK. OK, so what about the more distant future? JWST is coming. That will allow us to make measurements in the rest frame infrared uh, with great ease uh, over the whole range uh, that's of interest. And I think that will redo the uh, measurements using the supernovae. Measurements from the ground are also going to be possible be with the giant new telescopes, the giant Magellan Telescope. India, I'm sorry to say, has joined with the other telescope, the 30 meter telescope. But anyway, this is the one we're working on. Uh, that will have very high resolution, 10 times better than space telescope, and 100 times the collecting area to make the kinds of measurements we've been talking about from the ground. So it's a picture now of cosmic deceleration from dark matter, acceleration from the dark energy, and it seems to me our task is to find out uh, what the dark energy is. Uh, one of the tools that people are talking about, and we heard a lot about uh, yesterday, I'm sure we'll hear more about it, uh, is Euclid, which is going to use baryon oscillations and weak lensing to measure the dark energy properties. Uh, it's too bad that it isn't Snooklid, because a telescope like that could do a very good job uh, with supernovae too, and the one that was proposed in the US uh, uh, was going to do that. Okay, well, I talked about uh, the Milky Way. In fact, M31, our nearest neighbor, whose distance was measured by Hubble, is headed toward us. Our distant future could be, if the energy, if the dark energy is the cosmological constant, literally exponential expansion. So that means that galaxies will be going over the horizon. The number of galaxies that we can see will get fewer and fewer. Eventually, M31 will collide with us. And so in the future, the Milky Way will be the universe. Thank you very much. Traditional cosmology is the other way around now. And with this plan which you have laid, let us see what the audience has to think. You are unfortunately cockroached into your discussion time. Well, I had to so, show the uh, so pictures of Sweden. Of so that should come just a few time. questions. Are oh, you all spellbound? No, no. So, 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 the, yeah. so, so I thought that the dominance is right now is a photometric calibration rather than intrinsic. Uh, of the, uh, so, after, so I guess what your point is, after correcting, after improving the photometric calibration, infrared is the way to go to further reduce the intrinsic scatter. So my question is, now photometric calibration is giving you delta W of 0.1. Now, uh, with this uh, infrared, uh, so you, you improve the scatter, then what, how, that, what, how much W right. that is? So the question, right. Yeah. So the question is, what is the principal source of systematic error? Uh, some people say it's the photometric calibration from the, uh, out to these uh, faint magnitudes. I don't think that is entirely correct. I think that uh, the real problem is the correction for reddening. And it's a long technical discussion. Some people do the reddening and the brightness correction together. Uh, I think it's much more logical to do them uh, separately. But in any case, they will be much smaller uh, for the infrared. So I think the way to decrease the systematic errors is, of course, to improve the photometric calibration. But I think the most important thing uh, is this uh, kind of uncertainty about what kind of dust is operating in different galaxies. And you can either learn about it or you can get away from it. And I think it's better not to learn about it if you can possibly avoid it. And the way to avoid it is by working in the near infrared. Um, have the problems with the dust reddening laws uh, been reduced, like uh, the discrepancy between the dust reddening laws that you infer from supernovae and those yeah. in the local Yeah, universe? that's exactly what I was alluding to. Okay. Uh, and here's, here's the short form of the story, which, which is that uh, it, uh, uh, this is kind of a technical discussion, but the question is, what's the ratio between the reddening and the absorption? Uh, Walter Bada, one of the great astronomers of all times, 
uh, when asked on his retirement whether he would do the same thing again, said, only if I could be assured that the ratio of total to selective absorption was the same. Uh, this is a very vexing problem. And what people have found is that you get the, the least error in the supernova solutions by using a very unrealistic uh, value for this ratio, uh, which is a small value. And what this plot shows is that we have worked this out by using the cases where we have infrared and optical data. We've worked out what A sub V is, uh, or R, uh, is uh, this ratio. Uh, and it looks like the Milky Way value for small extinction and it looks different for big extinctions. And when people have used this to correct their, um, their assemblies of data, they've weighted those heavily reddened ones uh, quite a bit. So I think that's a little misleading, that in fact most of the absorption is fairly small and fairly similar to that of the Milky Way. Nevertheless, I think the argument is get away from this and work in the infrared. Yeah, so and infrared would be better. <laughs> Is there any reason why the number of supernovae in the intermediate redshift seem to be smaller compared to very high redshift? You showed the latest data. Yes. And it's a purely technical reason. The reason is that uh, nearby, uh, the supernovae are bright, and so you can look over a big area of the sky very quickly and find them. Uh, for very distant ones, uh, if you look at a small area of the sky, you can find enough of them to populate your sample. But in between is the difficult part, where you have to cover a large area of the sky, but to great depth. And uh, this uh, is now something which we know how to, oh, stop it. Something which we know how to do. Um, the uh, uh, Palomar uh, Transient Factory and PanStars are two systems which are working now, which cover big chunks of the sky uh, to great depth. And especially PANSARS, which I've been involved with, we've been following up the 1As in that. We have several hundred uh, in the interesting range of redshift of about 0.2 to 0.3, which is far enough away that the cosmological signal uh, ought to be measurable. So we're going to follow that up. And I think that would be the source of supernovae uh, to use for uh, targets for HST if we can get the time next year. Do you observe any uh, directionality dependence of the acceleration? I'm sorry. Is there any directionality dependence yeah, of the acceleration? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So uh, is it isotropic, you know? And uh, I would say we have uh, so little, uh, so few directions measured well that uh, we cannot put a reasonable limit on that. The sample that we are doing from PanStars now uh, is spread in a number of fields around the sky 10 different directions at different uh, uh, positions on the sky that will give us uh, some leverage on that. So I think that's a very interesting question, with whether it really is isotropic or not. All right, Robert. We have to leave you with this exciting uh, okay. prospect. And thank you so much thank you. <laughs> for inviting me. I want to apologize that my slides will be a bit more austere than in the previous talk. <laughs> so the topic that I will discuss is the black hole stability problem. So let me immediately tell you an outline for this talk. I will begin uh, with what one could call as a status report on the classical black hole stability problem. Um, and then I will talk a little bit about the case of extremal black holes and uh, finally talk about a topic which is popular in the high energy physics literature, namely the asymptotically ADS case. So let me begin immediately now with what is the, the main goal of this subject. And the goal is none other than understanding the nonlinear stability of the Kerr family of black hole solutions. So, well, this is a picture of Kerr, or more uh, appropriately, this is Penrose diagrammatic depiction of the maximal development of what I'll call Kerr initial data, that's to say, uh, of a Cauchy hypersurface sigma with two asymptotically flat ends. So, this is the sort of uh, 
region of care which is uniquely defined by data on such a hypersurface. Typically in textbooks one sees the so-called maximum analytic extension of this region which is much more complicated but from the point of view of dynamics it really only makes sense to talk about the maximum development of initial data. So this is precisely this region which is depicted here. So for the purpose of my talk, when I talk about the care solution, this, this is the care solution, it's just this region. So if you're familiar with this terminology, this is by definition globally hyperbolic. So the black hole stability problem is simply the following. Think of this as the solution of the Einstein equations, which happen to arise from current initial data, perturb ever so slightly the initial data, and ask yourself the solutions that arise by solving the Einstein equations, do they look like Kerr? And more specifically, do they approach dynamically the Kerr family in the exterior to the black hole region? That's to say, in the, in the shaded region, script D, do perturbations of Kerr find again the Kerr family asymptotically as you approach, if you want, the intersection of H plus A and I plus A? So that's, that's the question of stability. So uh, a more precise formulation of this question is given by the following conjecture. Um, so the conjecture just says in, in words what I said previously. So consider vacuum initial data, which is sufficiently close to the initial data on the Cauchy hypersurface sigma of Kerr. So again, that's sigma in Kerr. So consider a small vacuum perturbation of such data. Now, we have to remember that the Kerr family has two parameters. So let's think of the initial data as a small perturbation of Kerr initial data for parameters AI and MI. So I call this, I stands for initial. So you, you look at small perturbations of initial data uh, corresponding to uh, the Kerr solution with parameters AI and MI. And let us assume that AI is strictly less than MI. That's the case of sub-extremality. In fact, this Penrose depiction is a Penrose depiction of sub-extreme of Kerr. That's to say this is Penrose depiction of Kerr if uh, A is non-zero and, and less than M. So then the, the statement of the conjecture is that the maximal development, this is simply the way of saying the, the solution of the Einstein equations for that initial data. Okay. Then it shares certain properties of Kerr. So in particular, property one is that it, it again has what's known as a complete future null infinity. So uh, future null infinity, if you're familiar with Penrose diagrammatic notation, is represented by the script I plus a and, and B, and the statement that future null infinity is complete, you should think about it as some mathematization of the statement that far away observers observe for all time. Okay. So that's not something that you can actually read off these depictions. I have to tell you that that's, that's a fact about the geometry of Kerr and Schwarzschild and the black holes we know and love. So the first type of statement that one wants to make is that, well, this is, this is still true for perturbations of Kerr. That's to say, future null infinity is still complete. So Moreover, uh, the second statement is that if we restrict attention to the past of future null infinity, so that is, if you want, the shaded region here, essentially, then the metric approaches the Kerr solution for two other parameters, which I'll call MF and AF, and in fact approaches it in a uniform way at a sort of sufficiently fast quantitative rate. So I um, cannot point if I don't come down here. So I'll come down here. So in particular, 
when I say approach another care solution, I mean approach as one approaches this point here. So this is, this is the conjecture. So let me make some comments about this conjecture. Well, if you want, making sense of this picture is part of the difficulty of the conjecture. That's to say, even defining the notion of future null infinity for general dynamic space times, albeit arising from initial data which is sufficiently close to curve, uh, this already is a <coughs> difficult part of the problem, even defining what one means by future null infinity. Another difficult part of the problem is that there is no statement being made uh, globally. That's to say, one is not saying that the space-time everywhere is close to Kerr. In particular, ah, one is not saying that the space-time, ah, this is very difficult to use. In this region here, is very close to Kerr. One is simply saying something about this region here. But this region is not known a priori. This region is defined as being the past of this future null infinity. And this future null infinity you have to construct as you're solving the problem. So the region of stability, that's to say, even identifying the region of stability is coupled with understanding the solution. So this is, a, if you want, an additional difficulty of this problem. But to say it another way, we only expect stability outside of the black hole region. We do not expect stability inside of the black hole. In fact, there are other conjectures in general relativity which would imply that the, the solution's behavior near this boundary is in fact unstable. So you, you sort of have to separate out the region where you have stability from the region where you don't. It's not clear a priori what are the two regions. And the final uh, <laughs> comment that I want to make is, um, well, you might say, why pose this problem for Kerr? Why, why not first solve this problem in the case of Schwarzschild? And well, the, the point here is that, uh, well, you, you might think that you are perturbing Schwarzschild initial data. For instance, you, you might specialize this problem to the case where you are a small perturbation of Schwarzschild, so that's to say your AI is zero. Okay. Well, your AI may be zero. Your AF will not, in general, be zero. Okay. There is no mechanism under which you can ensure that uh, your final parameter A will be zero unless you are prepared to assume symmetry. So for instance, if you assume that you are axisymmetric and you assume that you sort of initially your A parameter is zero, then you expect your AF parameter to be zero. But if you are not willing to assume symmetry, and in this conjecture there is no symmetry being assumed on initial data, then there, there is no reason that <coughs> AF should be zero, no matter what AI is. Which means that one cannot study separately the stability of Schwarzschild without understanding the, the case of Kerr, at least uh, in the very slowly rotating case. So this is, this is the problem that uh, I am interested in. And to put it in some sort of context, let me compare with the, the only example of such a problem that has been resolved in general relativity, which is the stability of Minkowski space. So the stability of Minkowski space is a celebrated result of uh, Chris Adudu and Kleinerman. And essentially, it says that this type of result holds in the case of Minkowski space. That's to say, consider asymptotically flat vacuum initial data for the, for the Einstein equations, which moreover is globally small. And globally small simply means that it is close to trivial data. So it's close to the data that gives rise to Minkowski space. Yeah, that's to say, if you want, G bar is close to the Euclidean metric and K is close to zero. So then the statement is that you solve the Einstein <laughs> equations. That gives you this object M. And the statement is that this M is 
qualitatively similar to Minkowski space, so in particular it's geodesically complete. And moreover, it, it approaches the Minkowski metric with quantitative decay rates along all causal geodesics. So this is a, just a geometric way of saying that it has some totes to the Minkowski metric. So actually the theorem proves more than this. It proves that somehow the Penrose diagram of Minkowski space that we know and love is, is stable. That means that, well, you, you can still make sense of the notion of null infinity. That you can read off the Penrose diagram of Minkowski space. You can still make sense of this notion for this general class of space times, which are simply small perturbations of Minkowski space. And uh, in particular, you can define notions of gravitational radiation formally as certain limits on null infinity. And finally, you can make statements like uh, the statement that the, the, the past of null infinity is the whole space time. So this is just a statement if you want that perturbations of Minkowski space do not contain black hole regions. OK, so why is Minkowski space stable? Why, why does this? result hold. Um, well, you, you can read the proof of this theorem and find out, but that is rather long, um, about 500 pages. So let me give you a one slide summary of the proof. Uh, and in some sense, the one slide summary is quite simple. So the reason why this Minkowski space is stable is very simple to explain. It's stable because, well, perturbations radiate and decay sufficiently fast. Okay. So that's why it's stable. It's stable because perturbations radiate and they decay sufficiently fast. And the reason that the proof is 500 pages is that the rate of decay is just fast enough. Just fast enough. In fact, lest one thinks that this is some sort of technical issue without other manifestations. One can look at other equations which somehow are very similar to the Einstein equations when you don't look at them too carefully when you look at the equations from, from a distance. So for instance, you can look at the, the Euler equations, relativistic uh, compressible Euler equations of fluid mechanics. And these equations, if you, if you write them down, then sort of similarly, you can think of them as a quasi-linear wave equation like, like the Einstein equations. That's to say there are some system of nonlinear wave equations that when you linearize, you get the wave equation that we know and love. And uh, for that system of equations, the analog of stability of Minkowski space is false. That's to say uh, arbitrarily small perturbations of homogeneous solutions. You should think of homogeneous solutions as being the analog of the trivial solution in that case. Arbitrarily small perturbations form shocks in finite time. So somehow it's a miracle that you do not have this phenomenon for the, for the Einstein equations of general relativity. And uh, the reason is that somehow this decay rate, which in some sense is, in fact, when you first look at it, it appears that it's not just fast enough, <coughs> but rather it sort of just fails to be fast enough. Well. If you look very, very carefully at the nonlinearities, it turns out that it, it's just fast enough. So th this is really something that's quite remarkable, not widely known perhaps, um, how sort of uh, how exceptional it is about the Einstein equations of general relativity that even the, the trivial solution is taken. So maybe I should say at this point that the analog of stability of Minkowski space is much, much easier in a spatial dimension n greater than or equal to 4. In fact, it's sort of on the order of 4 or 5 pages as opposed to 500. And the reason is simply that, well, uh, if you've ever thought about the wave equation in higher dimensions, then, well, as you go up one dimension, then the rate of decay along the light cone goes up by half a power. And, well, that's more than enough, in some sense, to make all these problems completely true. So th three dimensions is quite exceptional. So let me just make a very important point, which is the following. That you might think that you know, all of this difficulty is because in, in this theorem, one wants to know all these nice statements. That's to say, 
you might think a priori that somehow, you know, if, suppose we, we didn't really care to know that you, know, you approach the Minkowski metric at a very fast rate or whatnot. You just wanted to know something. You just wanted to know that, well, you perturb vacuum initial data and you solve the Einstein equations that, you know, nothing too bad happens. You just want to know, let's say, that well, you don't get black holes. Right? But you don't really care that you approach Minkowski space. So you might, you might think that, well, maybe if you wanted to prove a, a weaker statement, then sort of this could all be done much, much more easily. And the answer is no. The, this, this statement comes as a package. That's to say that um, if you do not show that you asymptote to the Minkowski metric at a sufficiently fast rate, then you cannot show anything. That's to say, there is no statement you can make about evolutions of such perturbation if you, if you do not make this very strong statement. This small here refers to some kind of metric or topology? Yes, well, obviously, right. So in order to you know, make sense of smallness, yeah, there, is, there is some complicated notion, yes. So th there is no shortcut. That's to say, there is no shortcut to what in the language of dynamical systems you would call orbital stability. That just say you perturb Minkowski space and you don't go very far away. You, you, you have to prove what in the language of dynamical systems is known as asymptotic stability. You really have to show that you, you, know, you are approaching Minkowski space. And the reason is that the only way that one has of proving stability results for equations which are as nonlinear as the Einstein equations is by understanding the dispersive mechanism. Okay. So hence all the comments in this slide. OK, so with that in mind, let's turn back to the black hole case. So what we just said suggests the following. If we can understand properly quantitative dispersion for, if you want, a suitable formulation of the linearized problem, then one expects that you, you can show nonlinear stability of curve. So somehow, even though this is a this is a nonlinear question, we are asking a question about actual solutions of the Einstein equations. So this this is a nonlinear conjecture. All right. Then the claim is that well, the key to understanding this, the key to proving this, is understanding somehow the, the dispersive mechanism at the linear level. Right. If we are to understand this, then this can be used to prove nonlinear stability of curve. And this is exactly what is understood in the case of Minkowski space. And this is exactly how nonlinear stability of Minkowski space is proved. So the, the reason that this nonlinear stability problem is a conjecture and not a theorem is because the linear problem has not been understood. So the linear problem has not been understood. Well, we, we very well know that if you linearize the Einstein equations, the Einstein equations are geometric set of equations. If you linearize, then you'll get a sort of linear set of wave equations on a black hole background. And this set of wave equations has tensorial structure. So you can consider a simpler problem where you suppress the tensorial structure completely and you just consider the, the linear wave equation on black hole backgrounds. So you can call this a poor man's linear theory. So this is, in some sense, the simplest type of problem that one can ask, understand the wave equation on explicit black hole backgrounds that we know and love. And of course, this. This is a very classical problem. So uh, study of this problem began with Reggie Wheeler, and many people have worked on it since. But it, it's actually only very, very recently that uh, this problem, this sort of simpler problem, this poor man's linear theory, has been understood. So let me just briefly say what, what had been understood classically. Um, and I will sort of just concentrate on 
uh, two results which uh, are, are due to sort of these uh, people who are boxed. So the, the first result I want to talk about, which is classical, belongs to the 80s, is a result of K and Wald. And this is, in some sense, the result which is closest in spirit to the type of results that one wants to show at the end. But this result is uh, specialized to the case of Schwarzschild. So this result says that, well, if you solve the wave equation on Schwarzschild for general initial data, then solutions of the wave equation remain bounded in the black hole exterior. So this is the result of K and Wald. So this result is nice, but of course, ideally, one would want to make a statement not only for Schwarzschild, but for the Kerr family. And moreover, one doesn't only want to show that solutions remain bounded. One wants to capture dispersion. One wants to show that solutions decay. So another result, which is often quoted, is a result of Whiting. So the result of Whiting concerns Kerr, but it is a result of the following form. They do not exist on Kerr a certain type of solution. There does not exist on Kerr uh, a type of solution which has ex explicit exponential growth in its time dependence. So this type of result is sometimes known as mode stability. But this type of result does not tell you anything about general solutions of the wave equation. So this result is compatible with the statement that generic solutions of the wave equation grow exponentially. Um, nonetheless, somehow, the very often you'll read in the literature that so the black holes are stable, and if you trace back the references, they will all go back to this result. But um, in reality, one, one, one cannot infer any statements about uh, this linear problem from, from this result. OK, so let me ah, control things from here. So let me just say that somehow in the past five years or so, this this problem, this poor man's version of black hole stability was understood. And well, I'm, I'm actually not going to sort of read out what's contained in, in this slide. Let me just say that the study of this problem, you know, through, through the study of this problem, uh, and various people have contributed, uh, all of whom are, are listed here, uh, we understand much better the sort of way to put together various ingredients that uh, allow us to talk about dispersion. And in some sense, this, even though all this was motivated by understanding dispersion on black holes, uh, th this has ramifications for other problems in sort of you know, more classical problems uh, in mathematics, for instance, understanding uh, waves outside of obstacles, so the classical obstacle problem. Uh, in any case, let me skip to the, the bottom line as far as Kerr is concerned, uh, which is summarized uh, in the following theorem, which is joint work of mine with Igor Rodnyansky. So it's simply the statement that, yes, if you solve the wave equation, box P equals 0 on Kerr exterior space times in, in the whole sub-extremal range, so the whole range of parameters of Kerr, then the general solutions of the wave equation they are bounded, and in fact, they decay. And in fact, they decay quantitatively at the polynomial rate. That's to say, you can estimate the solution at any time by some constant that depends on its initial data times something that you can think of as t to the minus some power. And these type of statements are, in a certain sense, sharp. So, the point about this theorem is the following, that, well, if the nonlinear stability problem was a scalar problem, that's to say, if it were not true that the actual linearization of the Einstein equations had a tensorial structure, then this type of result would be sufficient in principle to prove nonlinear stability. Okay. So this, at the linear level, captures indeed the 
type of information that is necessary in order to understand numbers. The problem, of course, is that this is still the <coughs> poor man's problem. All right, so let me not going to talk about how these things are proven, but I just want to talk a little bit about the difficulties that one has to understand in order to, uh, in order to prove this type of results. So in some sense, the, the difficulties are the usual, sub, the usual suspects in this <coughs> field, namely the redshift effect near the horizon, the problem of superradiance, the problem of trapped null geodesics, and, and this is particularly important in, in, in the case where the parameter A is relatively large, so it's, let's say on the order of M, uh, the, the coupling of these three difficulties. So very briefly, of course, we, we all know about the redshift, well, we heard about the cosmological redshift in the previous talk, but um, we all know about the redshift which is associated to black hole event horizons, uh, which is typically told in terms of observer A who crosses the horizon and sends a signal to observer B who, who doesn't. But actually, there's, that's to say, if A sends a signal to B, uh, what is the redshift of that signal that B measures at horizon crossing time? Well, it turns out that this uh, depends only on the surface gravity of the event horizon. So already, maybe I should advertise that if you go to the extremal case, the, this surface gravity vanishes. So that means that the redshift, which is felt by observer B who crosses the horizon, at horizon crossing time vanishes. So uh, I will refer to this again later. So this is the redshift effect. This is clearly a stability mechanism. So one of the difficulties is you have to capture this. So the next problem is the problem of superradiance. So already in the Schwarzschild case, so it makes sense to talk about this issue. So in the Schwarzschild case, we all know that the Schwarzschild metric is static. So that's to say that there, there's a killing field d by dt. And d by dt is safely time-like outside the black hole. Okay. So if you want, look at any point here. D by dt is time-like, it points in this direction. So what does that mean? That means that if you look at the associated energies that are constructed using this time-like link field, then their fluxes have the right sign. Their fluxes are opposed to the Well, the only problem is that uh, d by dt on the horizon itself is null. So that means that, well, the energy fluxes are still non-negative definite there, but you don't control all derivatives. So actually, already in the Schwarzschild case, if you want to control solutions of the wave equation up to the horizon, there's a difficulty. And in fact, in some sense, this was the, the difficulty which K and Walt had to face already. But now, of course, as we all know, when you perturb Schwarzschild to Kerr, then no matter how small the A parameter is, there is always a region where d by dt becomes space like so-called ergo region. And what does this mean from the point of view of the wave equation? It means that, well, the corresponding energy flux corresponding to this vector field d by dt is no longer positive definite. So what does that mean? Well, you still formally have a conservation law corresponding to d by dt, but a priori it tells you nothing. And this is why a priori you can have solutions to the wave equation which grow. So this is why in in, in Kerr, even any sort of boundedness is a priori unknown. And uh, even, even this result was not known until two years ago. And solutions of, of the wave equation on Kerr did not grow. So this is the problem of superradiance. Okay, and finally, there is the problem of trapped null geodesics. So, well, it's easiest to talk first about Schwarzschild. So we all know that in Schwarzschild, the photon sphere R equals 3m is a time-like hypersurface with the property that there are null geodesics that wrap around this hypersurface. So they are null geodesics. They don't go to null infinity. They don't cross into the horizon. They just stay on this hypersurface, go round and round. 
Well, what, what does that mean? That means that, well, you, you can concentrate solutions of the wave equation for a long, long time on such null geodesics because these are characteristics of the wave equation. And there's, in fact, the general result about wave equations that says the following. You give yourself one trapped null geodesic, then the nature of any dispersive statement that you can prove changes. So that tells you a priori that you have to capture these. If you don't understand these trapped null geodesics, you will never be able to prove any dispersive statement of this form. <coughs> it's completely impossible. Okay, so these are the difficulties. Well, I'm not going to talk at all about how these are dealt in the analysis, but let me just say one point. Now, these difficulties are in fact coupled. So you have to ask your, yourself questions like, for instance, how does the redshift help you deal with super radians? Or how, how are the problems of super radians and trapping connected? And it, it turns out that one of the things that saves the day, and this is extremely important in, in the large A case, is the following uh, remark, that the difficulties of super radians and trapping are actually disjoint. This is not obvious uh, because, you see, if you look in physical space, then, well, of course, you can think in Schwarzschild that trapping takes place near R equals 3M. And, well, if A is very, very small, then super radiance is very near the horizon, which in Schwarzschild would be R equals 2M. So somehow for very small values of A, then it's very clear that trapping and super radiance are, are disjoint in physical space. But as you go towards extremality, then, well, these are overlapping. So it, it's a... It's actually a miracle about the curved geometry that uh, when, when you look in some sense in phase space, that uh, in some sense the trapped null geodesics uh, do not carry sort of high frequency super radiant solutions. And this, this insight in some sense played a very fundamental role in the, in the proof of that theorem. So this is also related to some work on, on the no hair theorems, but uh, let me not talk about that connection now. So in the remaining time of the talk, let me briefly talk about the extremal case and then the, the case of uh, asymptotically ADS black holes. So you may notice that I left out the case of extremal curve from the conjecture of stability. So this is a depiction of an extremal black hole. Actually, this is extremal Reisner Nordstrom. So extremal black holes have many sort of pathological features that I don't want to discuss. But you can still discuss the wave equation on the black hole exterior region. And the correct way to phrase this problem is actually the following. Don't, very often people look at the hypersurface t equals 0 in usual coordinates. Well, that connects this point to this point. That's a very funny hypersurface because uh, this, this hypersurface is actually uh, geodesically complete. And this point here corresponds to an asymptotically cylindrical N. But the correct way to pose this problem is actually to take a hypersurface that goes like this and crosses the horizon somewhere here. All right? Well, you don't care about what it does from then on. You just look at its domain of dependence. So that means you're essentially solving the wave equation in this region here. So in the black hole exterior to the future of this type of a hypersurface. So that's, that's the correct problem to pose in the extremal case. So this problem was considered, so first for uh, extremal Reisner Nordstrom by a, a finishing student of mine, uh, Stefanos Arisakis. And he showed two theorems about this problem. And the first theorem says, well, you still have a boundedness result, so you have the analog of sort of the K and Wald result for Schwarzschild, if you will. That's okay. And as long as you look away from the horizon, you still have decay. So if you're away from the horizon, say at this point here, and you go to infinity, you have decay. In fact, you have decay exactly analogous to the non-extremal case. So that's the first theorem. But there's a second theorem. 
And the second theorem says the following, that if you consider generic initial data as above, and you look on the horizon, then derivatives of the solution of the wave equation, they blow up polynomially in time. So that looks, if you're on the horizon itself, and you go forward, then derivatives which are in fact transversal to the horizon, they, they, they blow up. So this is in, in complete contrast to, to the, the case of non-extremal factors. So what's behind this is exactly the fact that this local redshift factor on the horizon degenerates. So this shows how important it was to understand the redshift quantitatively in, in the case of sub-extremal black holes. So this uh, theorem says that extremal riser Nordstrom is uh, linearly unstable. And it's an instability that you see on the horizon itself. So let me say briefly that uh, in the meantime, Aretakis has extended this theorem to axisymmetric solutions on extremal curve. So uh, recall that axisymmetric solutions of the wave equation are not subject. They are not subject to superratings. Now it turns out that in the non-axisymmetric case, there is an additional difficulty on top of this difficulty that Aretakis uncovered here. And the difficulty is the following, that this fundamental insight that was so important for understanding Kerr in the sub-extremal case, namely that the superradiant frequencies are never trapped, uh, this also breaks down exactly at extremality. So this degenerates exactly at extremality. So there's a sense in which superradiant frequencies are now marginally trapped. And this is actually related to work that can be seen in the language of quasi-normal modes by Anderson and Glabedacis. But the significance of this for the quantitative study of the wave equation is yet to be understood. So this is another interesting aspect of extremal factors. So very, very briefly now, let me talk about the asymptotically ADS case. So this is a picture of the simplest asymptotically ADS black hole, namely ADS Schwarzschild. And what's characteristic about the ADS case is that the structure of infinity is different. So whereas for asymptotically flat black holes, infin infinity can be pictured in these depictions as a null hypersurface. In the asymptotically ADS case, it, it is time-like. So what does that mean for the purpose of studying the wave equation? Well, first of all, it means that well, this is not globally hyperbolic. If you are to study the wave equation, you have to impose some sort of condition at the boundary. Right? And well, there, there's sort of a, an obvious type of condition to impose, that's to say that uh, there is no energy flux coming in from the boundary. So here are the results which have been obtained. In fact, this problem has been worked on by uh, two students of mine, two former students of mine, uh, Gustav Holtzegel and, and Jacques Menevici. So the, the first result is that, yes, it, it, it makes sense to s study the wave equation under these boundary conditions. So you, you have to prove that it's exactly because the space-time is not globally hyperbolic, even the question of locally solving the wave equation before you ask, well, how, how do solutions behave? Just sort of constructing solutions has to be done by hand. So the, the first result is the following. And he shows this not only for solutions of the wave equation, but more generally solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation with negative mass, but whose mass is uh, above something which is known as the Bright and loner friedman bound. I don't want to talk about what this is. It's familiar people in high energy physics. So that's the first theorem. And the second theorem says the following, that on Kerr ADS, so this theorem is very general. This theorem applies to generally asymptotically ADS spacetimes, which are not necessarily stationary. The second theorem applies to Kerr ADS. So Kerr ADS is the analog of the Kerr solution with negative cosmological constant. And it says that, well, on Kerr ADS, then solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation under these assumptions, uh, they are uniformly bounded in the exterior. So if you want, this is the analog of the K and Wald boundedness result for Schwarzschild uh, in this context. Actually, this theorem is very nice. It applies not only to exactly Kerr ADS spacetimes, but to families which are a, a perturbation of Kerr ADS. So it's very robust somehow. The, mechanism of this theorem. 
And the third theorem, which is joint work of folk cyclists with ABC, says the following. So the first statement of it says that, well, let's look at the question of decay. This was bounded, this, let's look at the question of decay. Well, on, on Core ADS, solutions of Klein Gordon equation, they indeed decay in time, and they decay at least logarithmically. Not polynomially, logarithmically. Now, if we look at the special case of Schwarzschild ADS, and further, if we look at individual spherical harmonics, then the statement is that individual spherical harmonics decay exponentially. So any individual spherical harmonic, the zero, first, second, etc., they all decay exponentially. The sum, logarithmic. So there is no better statement for the sum. And the final statement of the theorem is the following, that you can actually st study here a nonlinear problem under spherical symmetry. That's to say, you can couple the Klein-Gordon equation to the Einstein equations if you are willing to assume that everything is spherically symmetric. And the statement is that under those assumptions, you have nonlinear stability of Schwarzschild ADS. In fact, nonlinear perturbations of Schwarzschild ADS, they asymptote exponentially to Schwarzschild ADS, in a sense similar to what we were talking about before when I discussed the nonlinear stability problem. So, some comments. The third part of this theorem. It requires you to have a trapped surface present in the, in the data. That's to say, it does not apply to pure ADS. So this theorem says that Schwarzschild ADS is asymptotically stable. It does not apply to pure ADS. You might think, that's strange. Pure ADS must be simpler than Schwarzschild ADS. But no, you see, in pure ADS, there is an infinite number of stationary solutions of the wave equation. That's to say, there is no dispersive mechanism at the linear level. In view of the comments that I said at the beginning, that the only reason that we can ever prove nonlinear stability is because of a dispersive mechanism, then this already suggests that you do not have nonlinear stability. The fact that there is no dispersion it says that there is no nonlinear stability. Indeed, if you naively put back the results of linearization to the right-hand side of the equation and try to integrate at second order, you immediately see that solutions grow. But moreover, since there is a threshold in general relativity after which singularities form, that's to say if things grow a finite amount, which is too big, then, well, these heuristically uh, black holes form, then this suggests that initially arbitrarily small solutions will form singularities finite. So on the basis of the uh, above, uh, we had in fact conjectured that indeed pure ADS should be dynamically unstable. Now, of course, instability results are harder to prove than stability, but uh, following this work of uh, Holtzegel and Smulevici on the uh, stability of Schwarzschild ADS, then this instability conjecture has been studied numerically by Bison and Rostworovsky. Uh, and what they find is, is uh, uh, compatible with this conjecture. What do they find? They find exactly that uh, uh, generically uh, small perturbations of pure ADS data asymptote to ADS short. So, uh, and this is the final uh, slide that I will say. Uh, returning now to Kerr ADS, then uh, heuristic work which has been done on the spectrum of quasi-normal modes on Kerr ADS indicate that this logarithmic decay rate that Holtzegel and Smulevici obtain in part one of this theorem is sharp. Now, if you follow this argument here, then it turns out that, well, logarithmic decay is no better than no decay at all. From the point of view of nonlinear theory, if you achieve logarithmic decay for the linearization and you put it on the right-hand side of the equation and you try to integrate it in time, well, the, the integral of log t dt is not much uh, better than the integral of 1 dt. Okay. So whereas polynomial decay of sufficient high rate for the linearization is 
suggestive of nonlinear stability, logarithmic decay is in no way suggestive of nonlinear stability. So, in particular, don't be fooled by part three of their result in the, in the spherically symmetric mechanism. You see, in the spherically symmetric case, you have exponential decay. For any fixed spherical harmonic, in fact, you have exponential decay. It's only the sum that decays logarithmically. So you will not see this in spherical symmetry. So in any case, this suggests that, in fact, all asymptotically ADS spacetimes uh, are dynamically unstable. So in particular, that suggests that generic small perturbations of, um, uh, of Schwarzschild ADS or Kerr ADS may generate an, an infinite cascade of small black holes or something even worse. So with that nice thought, I will end the talk. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Really taking us, you know, formidable problem of stability, linear and nonlinear, curve and ADS, space times. You know, I must tell you, during my Cambridge days when we were being taught uh, stability uh, by Bachelor and G.I. Taylor, the problem seemed much less complex, but I'm sure in your generation you handled far more complex problems. And I'm sure at the risk of uh, encroaching onto the coffee time, we will have uh, discussions. Who? Pankaj. Uh, in the class of perturbations you were mentioning, you know, for the curve geometry, would you require that uh, the asymptotic flatness of the space-time is preserved? And yes. if so, how would you ensure that the perturbations obey this? Uh, how, how would you choose the class? Can yes. you do that? So really? certainly, in, in all these conjectures, when we say small, in addition to the statement that, uh, so this already applies to stability of Minkowski space, so I might as well say it here. But when, when one says globally small, then one means not only are you small in the sense that sort of at every point the curvature is small, etc., but there, there is a global assumption that means that you, you are asymptotically flat. And in fact, the smallness assumption has weights. That is to say, the further, in, this is just a statement of initial data, the further, the closer you are to infinity, the smaller the perturbation has to be. That's to say, if, if you consider perturbations which you might think are small, but they are not small in this weighted sense, then uh, the analog of this result will not be true. Okay? In fact, you, you, can, you can show that somehow you can create black holes from uh, initial data which is arbitrarily dispersed. So in some sense, it, small and the, you know, the, the curvature is as small as you want initially, but it's sort of dispersed in a ring very far away, but sort of uh, smartly put together so as for, for the, the gravitational waves in this ring to, to, to focus and by this focusing create small black holes. So the, the, in, in all of these uh, theorems, in, packaged in this notion of globally smallness, is sort of a weighted smallness condition, which I mean, not only imposes asymptotic flatness, it imposes more. So that's important indeed. Thank you. Okay. I mean, I can't, uh, but uh, kind of ask you a question about the first talk, really. The first talk told us that the cosmological constant is positive. Yes. And so why have people, sh I mean, I know in the ADS case, uh, sorry, in the DS, in the De Sitter case, we know long, re long time result of uh, of uh, Helmut Friedrich that yes. it is actually the, uh, yes. the stability. stability of nonlinear stability yes. of uh, uh, De Sitter itself. But what about Kerr De Sitter? Yes. Yeah, so actually, I, I I could have mentioned that uh, the analog of this theorem uh, can also be shown in the case of Kerr De Sitter. So, so Kerr De Sitter, in some sense, is strictly so. Uh, all problems with, cos with positive cosmological constant are strictly easier than the case of, of zero. So in particular, this, uh, this theorem uh, also applies in the case right. of... No, because it is easier, I thought there would be a stronger result, which might say that even the tensor perturbations are something or something. No, so unfortunately, uh, unfortunately 
from that point of view, you do not, so that aspect of the problem is not easier. But one, one thing I should say is that uh, there is a sense in which you can get stronger results, and namely, uh, instead of decay at a polynomial rate, you can show, for instance, decay at a rate faster than any given polynomial. But uh, potentially, you can even show uh, exponential decay in this problem. So exponential decay, from the point of view of nonlinear problems, is very convenient. In fact, the reason that the uh, stability of pure de Sitter is so easy in contrast to the stability of Minkowski space is exactly the, the exponential decay. But so, so indeed, that aspect of the problem is easier. But in some sense, this is the difficult. So we, we know a priori that the fact that this decay is only polynomial sort of will, you know, will give us the usual 500 page difficulty. But okay, that difficulty has been addressed. So even though it may seem daunting, uh, it, it's a difficulty that in principle can be addressed. Okay, so your conjecture is that and for the sitter curve, it is probably a Yeah, so step. the curve the sitter certainly, would uh, step. one would conjecture the exact analog of, uh, of this type of result, indeed. Question here. Uh, yeah. So, so um, if you start off with a near extremal situation for um, AI less than MI, um, is it possible to rule out uh, perturbing to AF greater than MF? Um, well, so in some sense, the the okay. So maybe let I mean in the nonlinear case, I don't know how it how you formulate things. So, so let, let, let me make uh, the following comment. So uh, just a preliminary comment that uh, you might ask, how, how can you have stability in this range, but uh, instability if you have equality? Well, essentially, uh, the claim here is that moreover, if, if you look at the smallness condition that you need to impose, the smallness condition will depend on the initial parameters. And the closer you are to M, then the sort of the smaller your perturbation will have to be. So uh, I just want to <coughs> prologue what I say that somehow in, in principle you know, th there is it's not inconsistent making this conjecture and having a different conjecture for for a equals m because you might think that a equals m is a small perturbation. But uh, as far as say the nonlinear question when you have extremality, so. I said that it looks at the linear level, you have this instability. What does that mean at the nonlinear level? Uh, well, that's not clear at all. But one thing which is one can keep in mind is the following, that there is a model problem that you can consider, which is the problem of uh, when you have a, a charge scalar field. And while there you also have the, the extremal case where extremality is defined with respect to the charge. So in that model, you can pose the question of you know, what happens dynamically when, when you sort of in spherical symmetry, because the, that problem you, you, can, you can talk about in spherical symmetry, which is much, much easier. You can ask the question, what happens when you, when you perturb, that's to say, if A sends a signal to B, uh, what is the redshift of that signal that B measures at horizon crossing time? Well, it turns out that this uh, depends only on the surface gravity of the event horizon. So already maybe I should advertise that if you go to the extremal case, the, this surface gravity vanishes. So that means that the redshift, which is felt by observer B who crosses the horizon, at horizon crossing time vanishes. So uh, I will refer to this again later. So this is the redshift effect. This is clearly a stability mechanism, so one of the difficulties is you have to capture this. So the next problem is the problem of superradiance. So already in the Schwarzschild case, it, so it makes sense to talk about <coughs> this issue. So in the Schwarzschild case, we all know that the Schwarzschild metric is static, so that's to say that there, there's a killing field d by dt. And d by dt is safely time-like outside the black hole. Okay. So if you want, look at any point here. d by dt is time-like. It points this direction. So 
So what does that mean? That means that uh, if you look at the associated energies that are constructed using this time-like flame field, then their fluxes have the right side. So their fluxes are composed of death. Well, the only problem is that uh, d by dt on the horizon itself is null. So that means that, well, the energy fluxes are still non-negative definite there, but you don't control all derivatives. So actually, already in the Schwarzschild case, if you want to control solutions of the wave equation up to the horizon, there's a difficulty. And in fact, in some sense, this was the, the difficulty which K and Walt had to face already. But now, of course, as we all know, when you perturb Schwarzschild to Kerr, then no matter how small the A parameter is, there is always a region where d by dt becomes space-like so-called ergo region. And what does this mean from the point of view of the wave equation? It means that, well, the corresponding energy flux corresponding to this vector field d by dt is no longer supposed to be definite. So what does that mean? Well, you still formally have a conservation law corresponding to d by dt, but a priori tells you nothing. And this is why a priori you can have solutions to the wave equation which grow. So this is why in in, in Kerr, even any sort of boundedness is a priori unknown. And uh, even, even this result was not known until two years ago. And solutions of, of the wave equation on Kerr do not grow. So this is the problem of superradians. Okay, and finally, there is the problem of trapped null geodesics. So, well, it's easiest to talk first about Schwarzschild. So we all know that in Schwarzschild, the photon sphere R equals 3m is a time-like hypersurface with a property that there are null geodesics that wrap around this hypersurface. So they are null geodesics. They don't go to null infinity. They don't cross into the horizon. They just stay on this hypersurface, they go round and round. Well, what, what does that mean? That means that, well, you, you can concentrate solutions of the wave equation for a long, long time on such null geodesics, because these are characteristics of the wave equation. And there's, in fact, the general result about wave equations that says the following. You give yourself one trapped null geodesic, then the nature of any dispersive statement that you can prove changes. So uh, that tells you a priori that you have to capture these. If you don't understand these trapped null geodesics, you will never be able to prove any dispersive statement of this form. <coughs> it's completely impossible. Okay, so these are the difficulties. Well, I'm not going to talk at all about how these are dealt in the analysis, but let me just say one point. Now, these difficulties are, in fact, coupled. So you have to ask your, yourself questions like, for instance, how does the redshift help you deal with super radians? Or how, how are the problems of super radiance and trapping connected. And it, it turns out that one of the things that saves the day, and this is extremely important in, in the large A case, is the following uh, remark, that the difficulties of super radiance and trapping are actually disjoint. This is not obvious uh, because, you see, if you look in physical space, then, well, of course, you can think in Schwarzschild that trapping takes place near R equals 3M. And, well, if A is very, very small, then superradiance is very near the horizon, which in Schwarzschild would be R equals 2M. So somehow for very small values of A, then it's very clear that trapping and superradiance are, are disjoint in physical space. But as you go towards extremality, then, well, these are overlapping. So it, it's, a, it's actually a miracle about the curved geometry that uh, when, when you look in some sense in phase space, that uh, in some sense the trapped null geodesics uh, do not carry sort of high frequency super radiant solutions. And this, this insight in some sense played a very fundamental role in the, in the proof of that theorem. So this is also related to some work on, on the no hair theorems, but uh, let me not talk about that connection now. So 
in the remaining time of the talk, let me briefly talk about the extremal case and then the, the case of uh, asymptotically ADS black holes. So you may notice that I left out the case of extremal Kerr from the conjecture of stability. So this is a depiction of an extremal black hole. Actually, this is extremal Reisner Nordstrom. So extremal black holes have many sort of pathological features that I don't want to discuss. But you can still discuss the wave equation on the black hole exterior region. And the correct way to phrase this problem is actually the following. Don't, very often people look at the hypersurface t equals zero in usual coordinates. Well, that connects this point to this point. That's a very funny hypersurface because uh, this, this hypersurface is actually uh, geodesically complete. And this point here corresponds to a, uh, asymptotically cylindrical n. But the correct way to pose this problem is actually to take a hypersurface that goes like this and crosses the horizon somewhere here. All right. Well, you don't care about what it does from then on. You just look at its domain of dependence. So that means you're essentially solving the wave equation in this region here. So in the black hole exterior to the future of this type of a hypersurface. So that's, that's the correct problem to pose in the extremal case. So this problem was considered, so first for uh, extremal Reisner Nordstrom by a, a finishing student of mine, uh, Stefan Osaliasakis. And he showed two theorems about this problem. And the first theorem says, well, you still have a boundedness result. So you have the analog of sort of the K and Wald result for Schwarzschild, if you will. That's OK. And as long as you look away from the horizon, you still have the K. So if you're away from the horizon, say at this point here, and you go to infinity, you have decay. In fact, you have decay exactly analogous to the non-extremal case. So that's the first theorem. But there's a second theorem. And the second theorem says the following. That if you consider generic initial data as above, and you look on the horizon, then derivatives of the solution of the wave equation, they blow up polynomially in time. So that looks, if you're on the horizon itself and you go forward, then derivatives which are in fact transversal to the horizon, they, they, they blow up. So this is in, in complete contrast to, to the, the case of non-extremal boundaries. So what's behind this is exactly the fact that this local redshift factor on the horizon degenerates. So this shows how important it was to understand the redshift quantitatively in, in the case of sub-extremal black holes. So this uh, theorem says that extremal Reiser Nordstrom is uh, linearly unstable. And it's an instability that you see on the horizon itself. So let me say briefly that uh, in the meantime, Aretakis has extended this theorem to axisymmetric solutions on extremal Kerr. So uh, recall that axisymmetric solutions of the wave equation are not subject. They are not subject to super -rated. Now it turns out that in the non-axisymmetric case, there is an additional difficulty on top of this difficulty that Aretakis uncovered here. And the difficulty is the following, that this fundamental insight that was so important for understanding Kerr in the sub-extremal case, namely that the superradiant frequencies are never trapped. Uh, this also breaks down exactly at extremality. So this degenerates exactly at extremality. So there's a sense in which superradiant frequencies are now marginally trapped. And this is actually related to work that can be seen in the language of quasi-normal modes by Anderson and Glabedaitis. But the significance of this for the quantitative study of the wave equation is yet to be understood. So this is another interesting aspect of extremal factors. <coughs> so very, very briefly now, let me talk about the asymptotically ADS case. So this is a picture of the simplest asymptotically ADS black hole, namely ADS Schwarzschild. And what's characteristic about the ADS case is that the structure of infinity is different. So whereas for asymptotically flat black holes, infin infinity can be pictured in these depictions as a null hypersurface. 
in the asymptotically ADS case, it is time-like. So what does that mean for the purpose of studying the wave equation? Well, first of all, it means that well, this is not globally hyperbolic. If you are to study the wave equation, you have to impose some sort of condition at the boundary. Right? And well, there, there's sort of a, an obvious type of condition to impose. That's to say that uh, there is no energy flux coming in from the boundary. So here are the results which have been obtained. In fact, this problem has been worked on by uh, two students of mine, two former students of mine, uh, Gustav Holtzegel and, and Jacques Monnevisi. So the, the first result is that, yes, it, it, it makes sense to s study the wave equation under these boundary conditions. So you, you have to prove that it's exactly because the space-time is not globally hyperbolic, even the question of locally solving the wave equation before you ask well, how, how do solutions behave, just sort of constructing solutions has to be done by hand. So the, the first result is the following. And he shows this not only for solutions of the wave equation, but more generally solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation with negative mass, but whose mass is uh, above something which is known as the Bright and loner friedman bound. I don't want to talk about what this is. It's familiar people in high energy physics. So that's the first theorem. And the second theorem says the following, that on Kerr ADS, so this theorem is very general. This theorem applies to generally asymptotically ADS spacetimes, which are not necessarily stationary. The second theorem applies to Kerr ADS. So Kerr ADS is the analog of the Kerr solution with negative cosmological constant. And it says that, well, on Kerr ADS, then solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation under these assumptions, uh, they are uniformly bounded in the exterior. So if you want, this is the analog of the K and Wald boundedness result for Schwarzschild uh, in this context. Actually, this theorem is very nice. It applies not only to exactly Kerr ADS spacetimes, but to families which are a, a perturbation of Kerr ADS. So it's very robust somehow. The, mechanism of this theorem. And the third theorem, which is joint work of Paul Segel and Smith ABC, says the following. So the first statement of it says that, well, let's look at the question of decay. This was bounded. This, let's look at the question of decay. Well, on, on Kerr ADS, solutions of Klein-Gordon equation, they indeed decay in time, and they decay at least logarithmically. Not polynomially, logarithmic. Now, if we look at the special case of Schwarzschild ADS, and further, if we look at individual spherical harmonics, then the statement is that individual spherical harmonics decay exponentially. So any individual spherical harmonic, the zero, first, second, etc., they all decay exponentially. The sum, logarithmic. So there is no better statement for the sum. And the final statement of the theorem is the following, that you can actually st study here a nonlinear problem under spherical symmetry. That's to say, you can couple the Klein-Gordon equation to the Einstein equations if you are willing to assume that everything is spherically symmetric. And the statement is that under those assumptions, you have nonlinear stability of Schwarzschild ADS. In fact, nonlinear perturbations of Schwarzschild ADS, they asymptote exponentially to Schwarzschild ADS in a sense similar to what we were talking about before when I discussed the nonlinear stability problem. So some comments. The third part of this theorem, it requires you to have a trapped surface present in the, in the data. That's to say it does not apply to pure ADS. So this theorem says that Schwarzschild ADS is asymptotically stable. It does not apply to pure ADS. You might think that's strange. Pure ADS must be simpler than Schwarzschild ADS. But no, you see, in pure ADS, there is an infinite number of stationary solutions of the wave equation. That's to say, there is no dispersive mechanism at the linear level. In view of the comments that I said at the beginning, that the only reason that we can ever prove nonlinear stability is because of a dispersive mechanism, then this already suggests that you do not have nonlinear stability. The fact that there is no dispersion it says that there is no nonlinear stability. Indeed, if you naively 
put back the results of linearization to the right-hand side of the equation and try to integrate at second order, you immediately see that solutions grow. But moreover, since there is a threshold in general relativity after which singularities form, as to say if things grow a finite amount, which is too big, then, well, these heuristically uh, black holes form, then this suggests that initially arbitrarily small solutions will form singularities of finite. So on the basis of the uh, above, uh, we had in fact conjectured that indeed pure ADS should be dynamically unstable. Now, of course, instability results are harder to prove than stability, but uh, following this work of uh, Holtzegel and Smulevici on the uh, stability of Schwarzschild ABS, then this instability conjecture has been studied numerically by Bison and Rostworowski. Uh, and what they find is, is uh, uh, compatible with this conjecture. What do they find? They find exactly that uh, uh, generically uh, small perturbations of pure ADS data asymptote to ADS short. So, uh, and this is the final uh, slide that I will say. Uh, returning now to Kerr ADS, then uh, heuristic work which has been done on the spectrum of quasi-normal modes on Kerr ADS indicate that this logarithmic decay rate that Holtzegel and Smulevici obtain in part one of this theorem is sharp. Now if you follow this argument here, then it turns out that well, logarithmic decay is no better than no decay at all. From the point of view of nonlinear theory, if you achieve logarithmic decay for the linearization and you put it on the right hand side of the equation and you try to integrate it in time, well, the, the integral of log t dt is not much uh, better than the integral of 1 dt. Okay. So whereas polynomial decay of sufficient high rate for the linearization is suggestive of nonlinear stability, logarithmic decay is in no way suggestive of nonlinear stability. So in particular, don't be fooled by part three of their result in the, in the spherically symmetric mechanism. You see, in the spherically symmetric case, you have exponential decay. For any fixed spherical harmonic, in fact, you have exponential decay. It's only the sum that decays logarithmically. So you will not see this in spherical symmetry. So in any case, this suggests that, in fact, all asymptotically ADS spacetimes uh, are dynamically unstable. So in particular, that suggests that generic small perturbations of, um, uh, of Schwarzschild ADS or Kerr ADS may generate an, an infinite cascade of small black holes or something even worse. So with that nice thought, I will end the talk. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Really taking us, you know, this formidable problem of stability, linear and nonlinear, curve and ADS space times. You know, I must tell you, during my Cambridge days, when we were being taught uh, stability uh, by Bachelor and GI Taylor, the problem seemed much less complex. But I'm sure in your generation, you handled far more complex problem. And I'm sure, at the risk of uh, encroaching onto the coffee time, we will have uh, discussions. Who, Pankaj? Uh, in the class of perturbations you were mentioning, you know, for the curve geometry, would you require that uh, the asymptotic flatness of the space-time is preserved? And yes. if so, how would you ensure that the perturbations obey this? Uh, how, how would you choose the class? Can yes. you do that? So really? certainly, in, in all these conjectures, when we say small, in addition to the statement that, uh, so this already applies to stability of Minkowski space, so I might as well say it here. But when, when, when one says globally small, then one means not only are you small in the sense that sort of at every point the curvature is small, et cetera, but there, there is a global assumption that means that you, you are asymptotically flat. And in fact, the smallness assumption has weights. That is to say, the 
further, in, this is just a statement of initial data. The further, the closer you are to infinity, the smaller the perturbation has to be. That's to say, if, if you consider perturbations which you might think are small, but they are not small in this weighted sense, then uh, the analog of this result will not be true. Okay? In fact, you, you, can, you can show that somehow you can create black holes from uh, initial data which is arbitrarily dispersed. So in some sense, it, it's small and the, you know, the, the curvature is as small as you want initially, but it's sort of dispersed in a ring very far away, but sort of uh, smartly put together so as for, for the, the gravitational waves in this ring to, to, to focus and by this focusing create small black holes. So the, the, in, in all of these uh, theorems, in, packaged in this notion of globally smallness is sort of a weighted smallness condition which I mean, not only imposes asymptotic flatness, it imposes more. So that's important indeed. Thank you. Okay. I mean, I can't, uh, but uh, kind of ask you a question about the first talk, really. The first talk told us that the cosmological constant is positive. Yes. And so why have people, sh I mean, I know in the ADS case, uh, sorry, in the DS, in the De Sitter case, we know long, re long time result of, uh, of uh, Helmut Friedrich that yes. it is actually the, yes. uh, the stability. stability of nonlinear stability yes. of uh, uh, De Sitter itself. But what about Kerr De Sitter? Yeah, so actually I, I, I could have mentioned that uh, the analog of this theorem uh, can also be shown in the case of Curtis Sitter. So, so Curtis Sitter, in some sense, is strictly. So, uh, all problems with, cosm with positive cosmological constant are strictly easier than the case of, of zero. So, in particular, this, uh, this theorem uh, also applies in the case right. of. No, because it is easier, I thought there would be a stronger result, which might say that even the tensor perturbations are something or something. No, so unfortunately. Uh, Unfortunately, from that point of view, you do not, so that aspect of the problem is not easier. But one, one thing I should say is that uh, there is a sense in which you can get stronger results, and namely, uh, instead of decay at a polynomial rate, you can show, for instance, decay at a rate faster than any given polynomial. But uh, potentially, you can even show uh, exponential decay in this problem. So exponential decay, from the point of view of nonlinear problems, is very convenient. In fact, the reason that the uh, stability of pure de Sitter is so easy in contrast to the stability of Minkowski space is exactly the, the exponential decay. But so, so indeed, that aspect of the problem is easier. But in some sense, this is the difficult. So we, we know a priori that the fact that this decay is only polynomial sort of will, you know, will give us the usual 500 page difficulty, but okay, that difficulty has been addressed. So even though it may seem daunting, uh, it, it's a difficulty that in principle can be addressed. Okay, so your conjecture is that in, for the sitter Kerr, it is probably uh, Yeah, so the Kerr the sitter certainly uh, would be what one would conjecture the exact analog of, uh, of this type of result, indeed. Question here. Uh, so, so um, if you start off with a near extremal situation for um, AI less than MI, um, is it possible to rule out uh, perturbing to AF greater than MF? Um, well, so in some sense, the the okay. So maybe let I me mean, in the nonlinear case, I don't know how it how you formulate things. So, so let, let, let me make uh, the following comment. So uh, just a preliminary comment that uh, you might ask, how, how can you have stability in this range, but uh, instability if you have equality? Well, essentially, uh, the claim here is that moreover, if, if you look at the smallness condition that you need to impose, the smallness condition will depend on the initial parameters. And the closer you are to M, then the sort of the smaller your perturbation will have to be. So uh, I just want to prologue what I say that somehow in, in principle you know, there, there is it's not inconsistent making this conjecture and having a different conjecture for for a equals m because you might think that a equals m is a small perturbation. 
But uh, as far as, say, the nonlinear question when you have extremality, so I said that it looks at the linear level, you have this instability. What does that mean at the nonlinear level? Uh, well, that's not clear at all. But one thing which is one can keep in mind is the following, that there is a model problem that you can consider, which is the problem of uh, when you have a, a charge scalar field. And well, there you also have the, the extremal case where extremality is defined with respect to the charge. So in that model, you can pose the question of you know, what happens dynamically when, when you sort of in spherical symmetry, because the, that problem you, you, can, you can talk about in spherical symmetry, which is much, much easier. You can ask the question what happens when you, when you perturb, let's say, extreme of uh, Reisner and Nordstrom, which is a special solution of that system. And it turns out that there's a very general result that you can show for that system, which is once you have a, a marginally trapped surface, then uh, there will be no naked singularities that form. So that's a completely general result. So that tells you that you know, whatever happens, uh, you will not have naked singularities. In fact, you can show more than that, but let me not say exactly. So the idea of that you will go to something that looks like uh, well, super extreme is, is out of the question, at least at the level of that model. So that suggests that whatever happens, it, it will not look anything like uh, super extreme. Okay. But other than that, it's hard for me to speculate on the end state of that. <laughs> I'm afraid.